Hello, everyone. Hello. It's great to see you. I'm, um, thank you for coming. I um, sort of thank you. <laughs> Part of me was hoping no one would make it. I feel like <laughs> I was praying for a snow day. I, I feel a little like a substitute teacher. That's part of it. And I wouldn't feel quite that much way if James didn't know so much about music, right? I know he knows a lot about the Bible, but it turns out he knows a lot about music, too. So I'm um, his substitute today. But I'm, I'm glad to get a chance to talk to you about some of these things. And um, the topic is music and, and the Bible. And um, it, it, it's hard, first of all, to figure out how to get into that. But I, the, the, the way most Christian bookstores do is with the verse... Um, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. So if you go to a bookstore, probably like ours, though I didn't check this morning, there are plaques everywhere with that verse on it. That's the one. It usually has a treble clef or it has some kind of note or some kind of indication that uh, that psalm, particular psalm, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And that's the verse that most people know. So in the, in the Bible, we have lots of references to music, but they're all, almost all of them are about praise. The idea of praising, of celebrating something. And, of course, you probably know, or, <clears throat> and they're mostly corporate. Everyone does this together, though there are some private ones. But you also know, of course, that the Psalms is the hymn book, basically, of the Bible. That's the, the sort of uh, normal thing that you would do. So, make a joyful noise of the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing is sort of the key verse of all of that. My verse, though, is different than that. My personal first favorite verse for music is 1 Chronicles 15.22. I'm sure you've been reading through Chronicles lately. Uh, <laughs> and so this is a verse that you have come up with, um, which is this. I love this. Hananiah, chief of the Levites, was in charge of the singing. He gave instruction in singing because he was skillful. <laughs> because he was skillful. Yeah, the NIV says because he was good at it. <laughs> so I love that verse. He instructed the singing because he was good at it. And I think that's a pretty good goal, right? So that's sort of my verse right now, to be good at it. Um, and there's a lot in the Chronicles about music. In fact, Bach quotes Chronicles as being the model for what a church music program should be. And we'll talk about that a little bit. It's a little strange because we so seldom read through these details, but we're going to uh, get into some murky territory there. But the issue is what frame of reference to talk about music and the Bible. There's a famous quote that is sometimes given to uh, Elvis Costello, which is, writing about music is like dancing about architecture. <laughs> writing about music is like dancing about architecture. In other words, music is its own thing. Once you talk about it, it's no longer music. It's, it's hard to describe in language what music is about. The two things are not necessarily uh, uh, connected. Um, so if you'll allow me, I'm going to put on my college professor hat. That's the uh, poofy one. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, and, and so the proper study of music in the Bible is actually ethnomusicology. It's a particular field. Ethnomusicology is where you're studying the, um, uh, my, it, which is not my field. Let me start with that. My field is Western art music and music education. So ethnomusicology, though, is studying music in its cultural context. So when is music made? How is it made? In its social and cultural context. So uh, the, we're going to begin there, talking about the Bible and the music concept, because we don't know what they sounded like. We have no idea what the music was, well, we have some ideas, but we have very little idea of what the music would have sounded like in biblical times. Uh, but I'm going I'm to give you some things to think about along those lines. What we know is that they did not have concerts. There was no commercial system of concerts and going to see things and going to this. That, uh, it was at, like most indigenous cultures, concert going has always been a sort of an um, elevated art, an upper class art, a wealthy art. And that hasn't changed very much, in spite of people trying to make those changes, like in the Charlotte Symphony and other places. It still tends to be people of a certain social class that goes to concerts as such. Um, so that was not part of their world, this idea of concerts. Uh, but music was integrated into daily life in agricultural festivals, in games, and in working, um, which work songs, which in essence is the... Um, and, and we grew up sometimes with this, too. Maybe in your car you sang, she'll be coming round the mountain when she comes, which is basically a work song. It's a driving song, right? Or um, uh, 
uh, what do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do? Right. Okay. These songs are just repetitive, but they're, what do they do? Hey, yup, da, 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 hey, yup. That's a pulling song, right? So there's all this music that is work related, you know? Um, uh, some of us do that when we're um, uh, washing dishes, you know, <laughs> or things, but, but not so often anymore. Um, so, what else? Lullabies would have been naturally. We assume they would have sung lullabies. Of course, people did. And they, but they would make up their own music. There was not, it would be whatever came out of yourself, right? Lullabies are strange in that sense, too. Like, you know, the one that comes to mind first, of course, is the um, a rock a bye, da 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 da, uh, in, in a treetop. Lest the cradle will rock and fall and the baby dies and, you know, the whole, the, the, so see the text is not the part of that, right? The text is its own sort of weird thing. It's the tune, the da da dee, the, the sort of rocking motion. So we don't know what went with the words with all that. In any case, so looking at the Bible music, that's kind of what we know to start. So a few other reminders, and this is just to get you into my head a little bit of where I'm thinking about this. First of all, the Old Testament is a really long time. So 1,500 years or so at least. So it's really hard to talk about any of the music. For example, 1,500 years ago was 524 AD. So if you try to think what music was like in 524 and compare it, say, to the old rugged cross or to Taylor Swift, uh, you know, there's not much connection <laughs> anymore, right? So there's a lot of changes in our own lifetime of what music sounds like from the 1920s, say, to now, or much less from 1620 when you listen to Baroque music. But it's all within a couple hundred years. But we're talking a thousand years or more. So we can't assume that music was the same just because we don't know what they were doing, right? So there's a different, we just don't know. Lots of changes and lots of different places. So that's one thing. The New Testament is a little easier. There are only 70 years or so in the New Testament. So, and we know what the culture was because it was monolithic. It was Roman, right? They stole their stuff from the Greeks, uh, but we don't know how much the Jews connected with the music that was already established. Paul doesn't talk about it, except to say to sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. But he doesn't talk about the music that was going on. But this was after Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides, so there was music. There was even printed music. But the Jews may or may not have had anything to do with that. But the curious question is, what about the Gentiles that joined the Jewish church? Did they like the Jewish music or did they not want to do the Jewish music? I suspect that was a little discussion <laughs> they had along with circumcision, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> right. So we know they talked about that issue, but did they talk about the music as well? Or what did that create in their world? To me, that's a fascinating i uh, like to get in their heads about that a little bit. Uh, what else? There was only live music. So this is, again, self-evident but important to keep in our head because it's so different than our world. Nothing recorded, no concerts. The only music you heard was the music that you or your family or your close friends could make. Or if you went to the temple and heard the temple musicians. So in our day, my view of that is, in a world in which there was no recorded anything, no televisions, no, mo no movies, no sound, except natural sound, that when you suddenly heard a D major chord on a harp, that would have sounded really magnificent, mm -hmm. magical even, because the day would have been really bland without that. We're so inundated with sound that it's hard to get our head into a world where music was magic. You know, we get to experience that sometimes. We have a magical experience. But in day-to-day -day life, you know, and you can experiment with this. Try going off of music for a week or two. And, and, and not, don't go into elevators. Don't go into stores. You know, the, the, the ability to do that is really difficult. But um, we have to go into their world. And then the other thing they would have had that we lose, in this room, for example, sounds of nature. Can't hear the birds in here or the, um, uh, the storms, you know, the, the, the sort of natural environment that has its own kind of music, bird music, right? So, any case, uh, no commercial culture. So you didn't buy music. We have uh, what used to be Brock's music store here for years and years. We have J.W. Pepper that sends things. There are boxes out there for me. Printed music, uh, commercial music, not to mention jingles, right? <laughs> so they didn't write jingles, right? Now, I would assume that the merchants that were sitting there in the street made up some song to talk about their scarves, 
right? <laughs> but we have no idea what those would have been or what those songs would, would have been like. So we don't have jingles. We don't have any commercial music um, in that sense. And so my first scripture, the first time music, a music person is listed in the Bible is in Genesis 4, 20 through 22. Notice how early that is. And this is Jubal. There's a famous song by uh, Handel called Oh Had I Jubal's Lyre or Miriam's Lovely Voice. Um, but what I love about this, Jubal is listed along with several other people. This, some people call this the skills verse because it's people with skills, which I think is nice. Uh, Genesis 4, uh, 20 through 22. Let's see if I find this real fast. Let's see if I can still read it. Uh, yeah, here it is. Ada bore Jabal. He was the ancestor of those who live in tents and breed livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the ancestor of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Zillah bore Tubal Cain, who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. Okay, so do you see what's happening here? Poor uh, uh, Jubal, the great artist, is listed right next to the cow breeder and the guy that's making their pots, right? <laughs> so the rest of the chapter has nothing to do with skill sets. Those are the only three that are listed. And so Jubal, as a singer, is right there in the middle. First one is breeding cattle and, uh, and herdsmen. Second is singing, and the third is this idea of um, uh, making bronze pots, making pots, metal, metal loads. So to me, that tells you where their world was. Singing was essential in the culture. It was part of the basic stuff of what they were doing. Jubal, the first one they listed, and he got to do it because he was good at it. Um, and I just think that's, that's really interesting. Uh, so he's right between the blacksmith and the breeder. Um, <laughs> so the imagery of the great artists, uh, great is a whole uh, modern invention. Um, I, I will do a digression because I'm, I'm somewhat famous for them. You may or may not know that Franz Liszt was the first to wear white tie and tails in concerts, um, the, which is sort of the standard uniform for orchestras. And it was because before his time, musicians wore a livery. They, they wore a uniform because they were considered servants. Uh, they were considered servants. So Mozart had to wear an outfit and his seat at the dinner table was next to the cook. You know, he couldn't sit with the other people. He had to sit with the cook. That was considered high among the servants, the head cook, but still Mozart did not like that, you can imagine. But Franz Liszt wanted to dress as well as the people that were at his concert. So he wore what they were wearing, which was white tie and tails. Um, now the orchestra's dressed up and we're casual. <laughs> right? But in that time, he was trying to dress up to match them. So the point is this, the idea of there being a great artist was not part of their world. Jubal was a craftsman, along with the pot maker and the breeder in that sense. And then lastly, and maybe most important, there's no known notation. When we say music, they mean sound, not anything written down. They didn't have a way yet to write down what the music should sound like. So it was what's called an oral tradition. They would sing it, and then the, the, the uh, uh, Levite would sing it, and then their boy would sing it back, and they would learn it that way over time. But there was no written notation of sorts. Um, there is, um, uh, and we know two things about that. One is that leads to not much change, because if you're trying to remember, you're trying to stay the same. On the other hand, it also means there are always mistakes, <laughs> right? If you, if you ever played that gossip game where you whisper something along the line, you know, it never ends up the same, right? So we could assume there were changes that we don't know about through these years, no way of knowing that. Um, and we have no recording, so we don't know. All right, so um, anyway, those are, I think, big things to get your head into Old Testament music, into Bible music, is to kind of think, it, it's hard to erase our culture enough to picture this world, to start to even hear their music. But we have to first get rid of all of our music and the, just the sort of cultural biases, I guess, are, 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 are the beauty of our own culture. Um, so one other uh, way in. At Furman, I taught a writing course very unsuccessfully. <laughs> but I, uh, it was a first year seminar for freshmen on how to become better writers. And, um, and the, the, uh, anyway, I won't go into the details of why it was unsuccessful for my viewpoint. But anyway, the, um, the students were great, but it was um, lots of writing and lots of correcting. You know, and, and um, anyway, the, um, the course, though, was called Music And. And the, I didn't design it, but I thought it was really a great course. And it was music and different things. So music and politics, music and sports, music and church, music and um, movies. And the point was to look at music in how it's used by the popular culture, the use of music. 
How is it used in commercials? How is it used in movies? How is it used in politics? Right, a musician likes to think music is out there in its own sort of world of just being this beautiful thing. But most of our world, it's commercial. Most music is used to convince you to buy a particular type of toothpaste, right? Or to buy an album, or to buy, download something. There's, there's a purpose behind it, mostly commercial, right? But, um, so, one of the things I learned in this class was about music and movies. And we are so inundated with that. And the sound in a movie is called the soundtrack, right? The music underneath, the soundtrack. So the soundtrack, is the sound of music behind what's happening. But music that is in the narrative of the story, so if you can follow me on this, is called diegetic music, diegetic. What that means is the characters are hearing that music. Diegetic, it's really fascinating. Once you notice this, it's hard to watch television the same way anymore, or a movie, because you start to hear it all the time. What, we don't have a soundtrack in our background. You know, when, we, when you kiss someone for the first time, there aren't actually Montevani strings, <laughs> right? It seems like it, but it's not there, right? But there is music in our world. So the narrative, the diegetic music, is music in a movie that is actually in the narrative that the students, that the characters hear, all right? So two famous examples. Once you hear this, you, you can't unlearn this. You'll start to notice it all the time, and I promise you, it'll drive you crazy. Uh, <laughs> um, so two, two famous examples. There's a Broadway musical called Cabaret, and it became a very famous movie that won the Academy Award. That movie, even though it was based on a Broadway musical, was done with all diegenic music. There is no music in the musical that you just suddenly start to sing. And the way the director did that was have all the music happen in the, in the concert hall itself, where in the Sally Bowles um, uh, club. All the music takes place in the club. When you go outside of the club, any of the other songs are played on a record player that she has in her office, in her, in her um, uh, apartment. Or it's a band that's walking down the street playing the music. He's very careful and very deliberate about this. So there's no soundtrack. It's all diegetic music in the whole movie, even though it's a musical. It's really brilliant to watch, and um, purposeful and very carefully done. Um, what's another example? Uh, the Star Wars has one of the best soundtracks of all, right? The very beginning of that is all beautiful. The part of the music that is diegetic, though, diegetic, is the cantina scene, where they go into the canteen and they're hearing those instruments, right? So most movies go back and forth. So once you hear that, it kind of changes everything once you watch a movie. You start to hear, what, did they, what are they hearing? You know. So with, and, and, and a lot of movies deal with this in other ways. They'll play the radio in the car when they're driving, so you know that the characters are actually hearing it. You know, so it's just something interesting to look for. But, but it comes around to our thing in this sense. The question is this, what music did Moses hear? So what is the music, what is the diegetic music in the Bible? What is the music that he would have heard? We that grow up in the church can't read the Bible without hearing the hymns that we know. We can't think of Moses without hearing the strings as he lifts his hands to part the Red Sea, right? There's a ya da 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 ba 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 ba, right? And you think anytime Moses enters, there's going to be a fanfare. But, you know, there wasn't in his life. It was just quiet. And so trying to get into what music did Moses hear is how I want to kind of start with this. And the one reason I want to start there is this is something we actually might know. We have some ideas about this because they were in Egypt for 400 years. And Egypt was the most sophisticated culture of the time. So what happened to the Jews in Egypt for 400 years? Did they hear all of this great music that the Egyptians were making? Did it have an influence on their culture and who they were and what they knew? We know that Moses would have heard it. Did the slaves? Don't know, right? But it does change the culture if you're thinking we're all in Canaan and suddenly we're 400 years in the most sophisticated culture of all. So sophisticated we still study them. Right? So I, I just think that's fascinating. So the other part is the Babylonians. So there was a Babylonian exile. Babylon was the other great culture. And so Babylonian culture we actually know some stuff about because they stole uh, from the Sumerians, the idea of writing on clay tablets. The benefit of clay tablets is they didn't destruct, so we still have them. So we actually have some physical proof of things that the Sumerians had. And in the Old Testament, they spent years there. The whole um, 
um, um, Babylonian exile. And we know they were singing by then because of the famous verse about how can we sing the songs in a, in a foreign land, right? So there's some musical connection there. They were hearing these things. And we know that um, the, the, um, uh, Daniel and others were trained in the Babylonian systems. We know that they spoke the language. We know that they, they had the different names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and their original names. Right? So they were cross-cultural. So I think there's some musical connection that comes into the Psalms and into what we're, uh, the history of our, our uh, music. Um, any case, so what do we know about the Sumerian culture? So let me get into this just a little bit. And, and this one, we happen to have the oldest musical instrument that still survives uh, besides a bone flute. <laughs> we actually have Bronze Age bone flutes where they would take a bone and carve it out, put holes in it, and then you could whistle on it, right? So we have some of those from the um, Stone Ages. Um, so we have that. Uh, what else? How do we know anything about the music? Well, from physical remains, things that are left, from visual images, from pictures of what they were doing, and from uh, writings about the music, things they wrote about the music. So that's how we know what we know, right? Again, physical remains, uh, visual images, pictures of instruments, and people writing about it. But there's a problem with the writing about music. One time, I, I taught at Davidson for a few, uh, two years, I guess, back in the 80s, and in my music appreciation class, <laughs> well, two things, I, didn't, I couldn't move along. I was supposed to cover all of culture. You may think the same thing today. I can't seem to get past the Sumerians. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I was supposed to teach all of music, like from the beginning of time until modern music. I, I never got out of the medieval period. Uh, you know, I had to skip Mozart because I didn't have time for it. <laughs> So anyway, they teased me, and it was all the evaluations, but we didn't know this was a, a um, what they call, a medieval music appreciation course. <laughs> but I, I couldn't seem to get, get moving fast enough. I couldn't believe how little you had time to say. Anyway, but one thing I did in that class that I loved, I said, write down on a card a description of the group, the Beatles, the Beatles. And then we collected the cards and read it, and what, what they realized in that process is what they didn't say were how many of them they were. They didn't say what instruments they played. They didn't say who sang. They, they didn't say a lot. They said, you know, they were a famous group from the 50s, from the 60s and 70s. Uh, uh, British invasion is a term used for them, uh, 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 famous in rock circles. Well, that's not helpful at all, right? <laughs> so it just asks all these questions. What do you mean by invasion? What do you mean by rock? You know, uh, they didn't, none of them said that there were four of them. Right. One person mentioned Paul McCartney as the singer, but that's it. Did the others then not sing? Didn't say who wrote the music. It, it didn't say that they played the guitar. It was just no information. And, and the point of that is we assume so much about our own world. And that's true in the music writing. And when the Old Testament talks about music, it just assumes that you know this. So because you're in their world. So they're trying not to. It's hard to get the language to work. It's hard to get it uh, to work in a certain way. Um, and so they just said things like, I'll, I'll jump ahead a little bit and say, Alamoth. So in the Psalms, it says, in the style of Alamoth. And um, most of the Bibles haven't tried to translate that because they're not really sure. Except now we think it means, like, for sopranos, upper voice, Alamoth. This is in the small print above the Bible, in, <laughs> above the Psalms. There's Old Testament, uh, they have little musical directions in there. Not all of them. Sometimes it just says to David, but sometimes they'll say Alamoth, in the style of Alamoth, which meant women's voices. There's another word for uh, down the octave, it means the number eight, which means bass voices. So there's some directions in there, but they just assumed that you knew what that meant, and of course that you could speak Hebrew, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, um, so that's no problem. Anyway, back to the Sumerians, because I don't want to lose them. The, the, the bull-headed liar, <coughs> besides being one of the most wonderful things to say out loud. The bullheaded lyre is the oldest string instrument recovered. It was found in the 1920s, and it is from about 2000 before Christ, BCE, a bullheaded lyre. So 2000 before, and it's in the museum. And um, it is, uh, it's been restored, and they've tried to fix it. And, but it, it's a lyre, and <laughs> this matters a little bit because, um, to shake up your world, David did not play the harp. Uh, David played the lyre. And they're different instruments. And so in spite of the translations, one of the problems in all the music discussions is the Hebrew scholars that were translating the Bible didn't know any of these instruments. So they had to just come up with something that was close. 
They knew it was something was strange, so they said heart, because they knew heart. But it was actually a liar. What is the difference, you ask? <laughs> right? So um, they're different st style and different sound. The basic difference is the heart strings are sideways. They go this way, and the lyre strings go straight up and down. So a lyre has a wooden box at the bottom that is a sound box, and the strings go up, and there's a crossbar. So it has a different sound. But what's interesting about it from our world, we always picture some beautiful woman on the harp, you know, leaning back and boop, 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 boop. But they had these crossbars could affect the pitch. So you could play with the crossbar and make an adjustment. Suddenly it's much more Eastern, right? Then we think David playing, the Lord is my shepherd. You know, it's probably more like something more like that, right? Which would have matched the cultures that they were all in. So it does matter that he played the kinor, which is a lyre, rather than the nevel, nevel, which is the harp. But it's so interesting uh, uh, issue. So we know some of this about the bull-headed lyre from the Akkadians, the Sumerians, Akkadians. And, um, and we know, I'm, I'm trying to go with the facts that we know, we know that there's a, there was a high priestess named Enidwana. This is important one because it's a woman, and she was a high priestess, and she wrote hymns, and we actually have them on clay tablets. And her name, she's the first named composer, Enidwana, long before the Bible. And she wrote hymns to the gods and goddesses of um, <clears throat> Acadia. Sargon of Acadia was the famous ruler of that time, and we have lots of physical evidence of this. What else did the Babylonian culture have? The other two kind of weird things. They came up with the seven-note scale that we still use. The Greeks borrowed it from them. They came up with the base 60 math system, right? So that's why we have a clock that doesn't work the same way our other numbers work. So the clock is work, works on base 60, divisions into 60, right? It makes no sense. <laughs> right? Um, they think it was because you have 10 fingers and toes, um, and so you, it multiplies easily by 60, and that's how we came up with it. Um, but we use 60 also for circumference, right? You remember your protractor in middle school. Um, all of this was invented by the Babylonians. So it was quite the culture. And again, like I commented about the Hebrew people going to Egypt, they then also went to Babylon. You know, now, I, I'm not one that thinks ha things happen by chance. God took them to two of the most advanced cultures ever and made them be there for a while. You know, that couldn't just be by happenstance. Uh, it seems implausible. Like any other country could have taken them too, right? But they went to the two great cultures of the time. It's really remarkable. Um, in any case, they came up with that too. Uh, we know because we have the notations. So the other thing you need to know about this, and then I'll try and finally get out of the Akkadian uh, Sumerian world. Um, this all took place around Ur. Why is Ur important? Abraham. Abraham. That's his home. So Enidwana was writing sometime, and this is biblical time, so within 500, 1,000 years of when Abraham would have been in Ur. So all of this Eastern music would have been in his head in some capacity, or at least could potentially in his world before he moved, before he left out. He was in the midst of this Sargon's empire that was monstrous, had really advanced music and mathematics and all kinds of things. Did he take all that with him? We don't really know, but it's a curious question, and it it's, um, happens to be that town, which is, uh, I think, really quite remarkable. Um, so, what do we know then once Abraham moved? The problem is we don't have much information about, like we have lots about the Babylonians, but we don't have much information about ancient Israel stuff because they were conquered too often, right? <laughs> For reasons you know, right? They kept moving and they kept being beaten, and every time they were beaten, they stole everything, right? So, we don't know where the stuff is or what has lasted and it was burned or destroyed, you know? So, we, we, there's a lot of stuff we don't have uh, because of that. Um, so uh, we, have, we have lost a lot. What we do know is that they developed their, what do we call it, tribal solidarity in Egypt. So they came out of Egypt as a people, right? Abraham came in, have all the wonderful stories. They went to Egypt. They came out as a country, right? And at that, or certainly as a tribe of people. But what effect did being in Egypt, this great culture, have on them and, and on their music? So we don't really know. 
but probably the greatest contribution of the Jewish population to our music in the, in the world is that the music was liturgical. That is, it's about the stories about things. And this we need to think through just a minute. Before, the other cultures did this some too, but music had a, uh, what was the word, Apotrop apotropaic is the beautiful word, apotropaic. Music, <laughs> it's one of my favorite words, apotropaic. There'll be a quiz at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, apotropaic means magical, incantational, uh, music that is, is meant to scare away things. Right? So indigenous people have lots of apotropaic music, music that is magical, that's to keep the, 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 the guys away, um, to keep the bad guys away. So, uh, and the part of the Israeli culture that may have been that were the bells on the hymns of the priest robes, were maybe from that old culture. You know, they had uh, uh, bells on the bottom of their uh, hymns, and you would have that sound. Some people think that was apotropaic, that it was a warding off evil kind of thing. But what the Jews gave to us, this culture gave to us, is a movement from music that was incantational or magic. Think Witch of Endor or witch music or, you know, the uh, double, double toil and trouble. Incantational music to music that was narrative. To music that was narrative. Music that told the story of the people. Right? So if you can think of this culturally, you can think, oh, they went from incantational, which an Indwana would have been writing, incantational praise to the goddess of the moon, to music that Miriam wrote that was remember what God did. This is what happened. So God, the, the Jews came up with this narrative idea through Miriam, the first, again, through a woman, that the first singing that we know was her saying, horse and riders thrown into the sea, let's celebrate what has happened. So I think that's really a fascinating uh, concept. So suddenly the, the Jewish people come up with this liturgical function this sense of we're going to remind you all the time of what you need to know through music. And it's going to be narrative so that we can keep repeating the story so that you remember the story. Um, so this liturgical function is immensely important because we still do it, right? One reason it was such a contribution, our church still follows this guideline. We have scriptures at certain times. We use the Psalms as a reminder of the seasons. We have basically an agricultural system where we're, it's this time of year, this time of year, this time of year, that's now related to Christology, to, to the life of Christ and, and his work. And this was all in the music. This was all musically, musically driven, uh, which I think is really interesting. So uh, back to First Chronicles. In First Chronicles, we get the, the immense detail about how their music was, um, unless you want me to review the Sumerians again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in First Chronicles, we have these great listings of what the temple music was like. And it was quite, 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 quite organized. In fact, um, it, there were 24 choral groups in the temple and 288 musicians that played for 21 weekly services. Okay, so I mean, it, it's just, it, it, it wasn't just you'd go once a week like we think, or maybe maybe if you're Baptist you go on Wednesday and Sunday, but but it would be 200 the the temple high degree of organization, 24 choir groups, 288 musicians, and 21 weekly services, and they were required. The musicians had to have skill with the cymbals, with with the harps or the lyres, with stringed instruments, plus in singing, and they had to be able to prophesy. Right. <laughs> And so those were so, some of the requirements um, of, 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 um, of those. And um, we don't really know what they sang like, but they had this, um, we, we, we know that they chanted, or, or uh, the word we use is cantillation. They sung the, the, the Jewish prayers. They sung the scripture. We do know that. And um, the Jewish tradition still includes some of that. Whether it is what they did in the Old Testament, we have no idea, but it's stuck there. So, uh, where pray, oh, Miriam, who then uh, has this new narrative model, gave the model for all of the Psalms, which is this, praise God because he dot, dot, dot. So almost all the Psalms follow that same model, praise God because dot, dot, dot. And then they list the things and then says at the end again, praise God, praise God, praise God. So she set that up with her first thing, we're praising God for what he did, the horse and rider are in the sea. 
And so it sets a model for Israeli music, for Jewish music of this time period, sung by women, which is really interesting. And, and that means, and she's labeled as a prophetess, Miriam. So she was a prophetess doing this. And she play, did this was done with timbrel and with dancing with timbrel and with dancing. So the women's choir is going to try some timbrel and dancing uh, <laughs> soon, right? Um, <laughs> so thinking of the later history of the church where women were uh, pushed aside, in this time they led in worship. Women's choirs were singing, dancing, and playing timbrels. Um, uh, timbrels actually are, are a type of drum. They're not um, uh, finger symbols. They, they may have had finger symbols as well. That would have been the symbols, but they're, they're uh, like, uh, and not tambourines. The, the King James calls them tambourines. They didn't have those. They had wooden toffs. They're wooden drums without the jingles on the side. So they would play the drum, and they would have different sort of sounds to that. But um, uh, so it's a little bit different than, than we imagine. And with dancing. Uh, it, later, you know, it was women who sang to David, that Saul had slain, slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. Again, groups of women uh, singing. It wasn't until the time of Samuel that women started to get pushed out. And he started a group called the Sons of the Prophets. <laughs> sons of the Prophets. And it seems really direct to, you know, specifically. It's like the Sons of the Prophets are going to do this. The women can go back home or whatever. So it started to, um, he started to change the system. And I think that's interesting. Um, but particularly interesting because that's maybe where David was trained in his music. So it was open to everyone, not just to the elite, these uh, halls, uh, this, this training of musical skills. And the Levite boys, David wasn't a Levite, but the Levite boys started very young. They had five years of intense musical training, and then, but they weren't allowed to sing at church until they were 30. Yeah, which is really interesting, right? So they knew something about teenagers, <laughs> right? And so I think it's really interesting because in recent years, they've, frontal lobe and all this, have decided that 28 is fully mature now as opposed to 18 or other age. And even uh, when they did Obamacare, you know, it was at 28, they can get all to 26, 28, that general area. But anyway, the temple didn't get to do this until you were 30. Also, trivial fact, but, but important to me, the, um, it's the only mention of retiring in the Bible. The Bible doesn't have anything about retiring except for the singers. The singers retired at age 50. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> right, uh-oh, it's right, right. So, and, and any singer knows what happens is the voice starts to have things happen. So they worked in the temple from 30 to 50, and then they no longer had to do that. And so I just find that really fascinating. Almost all other Old Testament stuff is you work until you fall, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, so 30 to 50 were the years of, of working in the temple, and um, they had always uh, 12 people singing at all times in rotation. So they would keep shifting around 12 at a time, and then they would go to the next 12 or the next 12. So they had lots of people that were prepared to do this, to keep the music perpetual in the, in the temple. Um, I think it's a funny side note to that. They were supposed to be taken care of financially, paid. Right? So they, these are paid singers. Um, but in Nehemiah, it says they went on strike, basically. <laughs> and um, let me see how the new RSV. It, it's a little unclear what exactly happened. But um, they did not get the money they wanted. Oh, I wrote down already, so I don't have to look it up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, they, 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 in Nehemiah 13, I also discovered that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. So the Levites and the singers who performed the service had gone away, each to his own field. That is, they went back and farmed their own fields again. So they had to go back to farming, right? So it says they went away. Some translations say they, they left, they were sent away. It's unclear, but I like to think they went on strike. <laughs> so they were not paid, and so they all went back to their fields. They had to go back to be farmers again. Um, in any case, that's when they're starting to rebuild, and so then they talk about how to rebuild the temple, temple and, and get the money back. Um, so anyway, I, I, I just think that's fascinating. So they each went to their own, own field. Um, so, but they were well-trained in singing, and they had lots of practice and lots of time doing this. Uh, we don't know what they sang, except we know some things about culture at the time, so I'll kind of go through that. Music has uh, what's called texture, that is layers. We're, we are in a world of um, what's called homophonic music, music with chords. So homophony, uh, music with chords, is the one, four, five, one. The 
music we're so used to, right? So then there's a melody on top of it, but there's a tune. Right, with that chord. Right. Those of us that are musicians take time to label all those chords and know what we're doing. But all of you know them. You hear them all the time. The hymnal has four parts, right? All the hymns have four parts. That's homophonic music. The four chords are moving at the same time. Polyphonic music means multiple phonics, multiple sounds. This would be like the music of Bach, where the lines go against each other, where two, two parts are going against each other. Monophonic music means one. Mono is one. So monophonic music is when I sing by myself. Just the tune. Da, 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 de, da, 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 da. But the problem is we can't really sing monophonic music anymore without hearing a harmony underneath it. You may not know you're hearing that, but it's in the tunes that we write. We have the harmony sort of built in. So we don't really sing monophonic music. But they did, and they would, this is what's hard to get our ears around. They didn't hear the harmonies that we hear. That would have been foreign to them. And it makes me think, this is again a little aside, What's heaven going to be like with all these people that believe that music is so different, right? David's view of music is so different than mine, you know, or, you know, all the people that think it'll be the Hallelujah Chorus. Well, you know, uh, Palestrina will think that's just hideous if it's Handel, <laughs> right? You know, jazz musicians will be up there, rock musicians. I mean, the whole thing, it's like what music, you know, sort of keeps you from getting too, too uh, smitten by the sound of hearts in heaven. Right? We don't know. You know. Besides, it'll be liars in heaven, not hearts. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, but this idea then that there is a, um, monophony, the one line, is, is more or less what they did, one chanting line. But they did something else, which is called heterophony. Heterophony, which means it's one line, but they change it. So it's ornamented. So if we both sing at the same time and we're not quite right, it starts to get a little bit off from each other. And so it starts to get a little more ornamented, or this bozo over there decides to add a trill because he feels like it. And then suddenly there's ornamentation, right? And it was probably some singer that was misbehaving, right? <laughs> right? He was told what to do, but then he added something because he thought it was cool, right? And musicians do this all the time. It's like, yeah, I'm bored with that. Let's add a little, let's add a seventh chord, add a, add a little jazz to it, something, yeah. Um, so this heterophony is what they would have. It's a single line, but it would be ornamented. And so there would be this um, sort of changing of things, a changing of sound. Uh, similar, I think, to the blues, which has some flat notes in it. It's a normal scale and then suddenly a flat note. Or um, similar to um, medieval chanting. Right? But probably with much more microtonality, like Eastern ragas, like ragas, where they actually bend the pitch more. Right? With those pitch bending, which none of you should do in choir. Right? <laughs> right. But was considered very common uh, in this world. So we probably kind of know that's what they would have done. But then the Old New Testament stuff gets complicated because of the Greeks. We know the Greeks had music, and, and every year that they put out a new edition of music books, they talk more about the Greeks because we keep finding out more. But you read somewhere in your dark historic past Aeschylus and Euripides and Sophocles, Oedipus Rex, and they says, those were written to music. The chorus was sung, and we have now found some of their music. So it would have been sung with instruments. The men would have sung in the background. There are only three actors and then a chorus. The three actors would change masks and change roles and do all the parts. And, um, but there would have been music sung through all of this that these guys wrote, the playwrights wrote the music. They were the Stephen Sondheim of their time, right? And they were all, all well-known, very popular, very familiar. They were in contests all the time to see who won who came in first place, second place, third place. But in any case, that, so what we don't know, and I hinted at this before, is what the Christians that were Gentiles that came into the church that was fundamentally Jewish, how those two musical traditions melded and worked together and what happened. We know what the middle, people from the Middle Ages think they did, but they had their own agenda uh, about what should happen, what, what could happen. So, um, but again, the transition was oral, um, uh, that is, so they had to remember things. So memory is the issue. 
So one of my favorite quotes I'll share with you is, memory is the casualty of the 20th century. Memory is the casualty of the 20th century. Most people can't remember their own phone number anymore or the number of their friends or children. But when we were little kids, we had to memorize our phone number and our address and say it out loud. School was based on standing up and reciting. You would, uh, uh, um, Seth the Raven, nevermore, or, you know, gaily bedight a gallant knight in sunshine out in shadow uh, in search of El Dorado, right? It was memory work. And that has been, is just gone. And even those of us of a different generation age tend not to do that. That's that when society advances on one side, it recedes on another. And in a sense, we have other great things, but what we lost was memory, the ability to remember, right? So memory is the casualty of the 20th century. Um, but in these days, memory would have been key to knowledge, being able to know that and do things. So, um, uh, so they were teaching each other. But again, let me tell you how immense, and then I'll close moving into the Psalms about this. Um, so they were doing what we know as psalms. Of course, the psalms were written over a long period of time by lots of different people. It says in the front, but we know this was the music they were doing, right? And, but it says at the top some musical directions, and often it says, by David. But it might say, to David, and it might say, for David. And so we don't really know each of those. So David didn't sit down one night and write all the psalms, of course. It was over hundreds of years and lots of different people writing and doing it. But they followed the same basic pattern. Praise God because he, dot, 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 the narrative idea that I said. There are some, of, and usually then it was included with the, and be sure to bash the teeth in of our enemies, you know, praise God, <laughs> right? There's often this sort of uncomfortable side note of, you know, while, while you're making us better, be sure to, you know, dig into them. I think we forget sometimes in Psalm 23, that awkward thing of, you know, table for me in the presence of mine enemies. You know, it's not enough that you feed me. Make sure that he sees that I'm doing great and he's not. You know, this, it's such a beautiful psalm, and then that one little dig is in there, um, which I, I think is interesting. But the, the temple music is, the, is where this all was, was wrought. And um, uh, so what did they have? The, the temple orchestra had 12 instruments, a choir of 12 male singers eventually. The instruments were the kinor, <laughs> uh, the nevel, the shofar, which you probably know, the hatzazrat, not, not the hot and tots, the uh, hatzastrat, uh, which is a trumpet, and different types of pipes, or aulis, like the Greeks had uh, multiple things, which are the halio, the alamoth, and the ugav. It also had the temple, it also had uh, symbols made of copper, and the talmud, this is a quir quirky little story, the talmud also mentions that there was a pipe organ called a magrepha. And um, uh, not the water organ that the Greeks had already invented, but a magrepha. So some people think that at the time of Jesus, there would have been a magrepha here in the church, a pipe organ. So, but this is controversial because other people think that a bunch of German Jews made that up in the Middle Ages because they wanted an organ in their synagogue. And they had to convince their friends that there was an organ in the early temple in order to get it into the synagogue. Magrepha actually means a shovel. And the loud, they use the word loud noise. Magrepha means loud noise like a shovel. They think, some scholars think, it was used to get the ashes out after the um, burning of the carcasses of meat, after the offerings, right? But it would have made a very loud noise scraping along the, uh, the marble. Other people, the German Jews, claimed it was an, an organ that played loudly at the beginning as an announcing thing. But they, now they think maybe that was all made up. Um, <laughs> but again, in my imagination, it makes me think, okay, if they had all these symbols, all these aldus, all these hearts, nevels, cores, all, and all these instruments going on, plus they had maybe an organ, or we know they were burning flesh, and they would have these shovels to get the ashes out, it would have been a really noisy place. Right? <laughs> and dirty and smoky. And the whole imagery, you know, it's, it's, it's not like going to church now. And so my imagination went to another direction, but just imagining that when Jesus came in to clear the temple of all the temple changers, three-fourths of the temple might not have known that happened at all. Right? The whole place would have been bedlam. All sorts of things going on. And again, in my Sunday school imagination, I imagine him coming into a Methodist church and yelling at everybody and, you know, or clearing out the stores. Right? But it could be that there was so much going on that only the group around him knew that had happened, not this whole place. 
but it's hard for us in our culture to get into this world that would have been noisy, smoky, stinky, and loud, right, in the temple. Um, but I find that's interesting. When the temple was, um, and I will start to wrap up, when the temp- so the point of all this is if you read Chronicles, you'll see that the temple music was immensely organized, and it was very carefully planned and, and, and terrifically uh, ordered. And, and the people worked, the musicians worked by lottery, which I think is really interesting. They basically had a rotation, but it was by lots. They would, would basically throw dice to decide who worked where or when. You had to be able to do all the different things, and so she would shift around. So if you're interested, First Chronicles goes into the gory details of all of this, how many musicians there were, where they worked, what they did, and, and moved forward. Um, <clears throat> but when the temple was destroyed, of course, the Jews went to a synagogal system, right? And the synagogues had already started, they're small prayer houses, but they would not have had all of this music, right? It, in, in no different than a big cathedral compared to a parish church, right? Or us compared to some of our neighbors, where the, the cathedral has great music all the time, a lot of Methodist churches don't have the resources we have. So the synagogues were much smaller, probably no instruments, maybe some percussion, but not all of this going on. It would have been much more chanting, much more reading, much more simple in that sense. But what the Psalms have that you know, I mentioned once the pattern, which is praise God because he did this. The other thing they often have is parallelism and, and this um, antiphonal sense, right? So it's uh, Jesus... Uh, um, God does this for us, and he does this, right? They're parallel statements. It's, it's their type of rhyming in the Psalms. It's a way of, of rhyming. So we say this sentence, then you amplify the sentence, or you say this sentence, and you say the opposite, right? So it's a type of parallelism. Psalms are full of that. That led to antiphonal singing. I sing a line, you sing a line. I sing a line, you sing a line, which is still very common in our churches um, and the way you do that. So this Old Testament music, and at the end of, of David's time, became the... Uh, songbook for the Christian church, right? We were borrowed from them the synagogal system of singing together, singing these songs, and repeating them. But we don't know yet what influence the Greeks, the Gentiles, had on that music before the fall of the Roman Empire and during that time period. Right? What we know is they started to push the women out, probably because women were connected with prostitution in the Roman church with music. And so they wanted that not to be a thing, and so it kind of hit it. Um, the harp playing went away for the same reason. It was used, and uh, the the oboe kinds of instruments were not used as much by the Christians because it was too sensual. You know, it had that sort of um, you, you expect to see Bathsheba undressing in an old movie. When the oboe comes in in a Christian movie, you know it's the bad girl, right? <laughs> you know, you know. So, uh, <laughs> um, so we 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 kind of we kind of know that's the case. But then the Psalms, in through that tradition, became our normal thing. So, to close, I'd like to, fin- to talk about one particular psalm that lists all these instruments. I've been laughing about them because it's so different than our head. And the reason is, a lot of the Bible we read lists instruments that didn't actually exist. So, they weren't invented yet. The vial is in the King James Version. They didn't have a vial. It wasn't invented. They didn't know what that was. It says organ. Well, the organ wasn't invented in the Old Testament. It was much, much later. There was no organ in the Old Testament. So the, the, the King James Version and others tried to come up with an instrument that looked like the Hebrew word. And they just came up with one. It said strings, and so they just said viol, right? Because a string instrument, for us, it's a violin. So they put those words in to make it. Now we know more about that these instruments are not at all what we thought and that they're very different. And I find that really fascinating. So with that, and I think it helps you read when you're thinking, oh, this is, plus it reminds us that this is a translation of a translation of a translation, what we're actually reading. So I hope you can use that to expand into other areas. We come to scripture with so much cultural information that's ours. It's really hard to let that go and try to hear from their ears. This is why I started with diegetic music. We're trying to hear what what Moses heard. What what music did they hear without the stuff we have? So um, so I'm going to end with this. This is Psalm 150, which you probably know. The King James says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Here's the instruments. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him with the loud cymbals. Praise him with the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Beautiful. 
but wrong. <laughs> um, so the new revised standard gives us this. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and with harp. Praise him with tambourine and with dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Okay. So here's a translation with the Hebrew words used instead. Praise him with blasts of the shofar. Praise him with nevel and kinor. Praise him with toph and machol. Praise him with minim and ugav. Praise him with zeisel shema. Praise him with zeisel turura. Let all that breathes praise the Lord. So that's what's up. Here are the instruments. Shofar you probably know. It's the horn, right? Ceremonial and military. The nevel is the ancestor of the harp. It's larger than a kinor. And it's a tenor voice, so it's low. It's lower than other hearts. It's a big instrument, big string instrument. 22 strings, 22 strings. Uh, Kinor, um, uh, well, so th that's the neville. The Kinor, similar to the harper lyre, seven strings, by the way, from sheeps. So David, our harp player, the instrument that played the Kinor, he was actually playing on the intestines of his own sheep. <laughs> Which makes you feel just a little bit creepy about Psalm 23, doesn't it? And it's like, by the way, he was a shepherd, but his harp was from the intestines of his sheep. Anyway, there was no store to go buy harp strings. You just had to, hey, Bob, come here. Um, so anyway, it just gave me will the willies about David a little bit. Um, uh, the toff is a hand drum, no tambourine, uh, just a little hand drum. The machel is interesting. Um, it's translated most dictionaries as dance, but it might not be dance at all because it makes no sense in the, in the psalm. Everything else is a musical instrument, and then it says dance. So some people think it was a different instrument we just don't know, maybe a woodwind instrument, some kind of pipe or, or instrument like that. So that's the machel, but they don't know. A minim is a type of string instrument. The ugav is, is a, another wind instrument of some type. The zitzel is, it means to ring or chime. And these would have been um, chimes, uh, like uh, symbols. We use the word symbol. But not Sousa symbols, not this kind of, they didn't have those. Why? It would have been super expensive, not to mention they didn't have the ability to make those kinds of big copper things. They had finger symbols, you know, the small ones. The biggest one would have been four or five inches, you know, like this. So don't think Sousa band. Um, um, but think, they would have thought that's very loud and clashing, even though they were that size. And then the, the difference in the clashing symbols, the loud symbols, might have been the way you play them, or they may have been the instrument, and we don't know. It could have been the technique with which you did it. But it's not just a repetition, it means more than that. It's something more specific, we just don't know what. Uh, what else? That takes us to, uh, yeah, so that gives you the list of it. So in the message version, which is contemporary training, he actually comes closer by doing this. Praise with the blast on the trumpet. Praise by strumming soft strings. Praise him with castanets and with dances. Praise him with banjo and flute. Praise him with cymbals and a big bass drum. Praise him with fiddles and mandolin. Let every living, breathing creature praise God. So what all these translations have in common, though, is everything that has breath, praise God. And that's where we started. The Psalms are about praise. Praise God because he did this with whatever Sumerian or Akkadian or Egyptian instrument you might be able to find. So thank you all for being here today. I hope that was helpful in some sort of way. So, yes, sir. Uh, starting with the last 2,000 years. Because that was a very interesting thing. Actually, did we know more about that? We do, we do know a lot more about that because of the, the scribes that actually wrote things down. Yeah, which, which does really help us. Yeah, I'd love to. Happy to do that. Yes, sir. Have, with what certainty have we been able to understand or reproduce the actual sounds of these instruments? Almost none, which is why I didn't bring any or sing any. We know what the shofar sounds like, right? Because they kept using it. Um, the, the liars we can, they have replicated, they've tried to, you know, we, they see pictures and they try to figure out pictures, so we, you know, it's hard though then to replicate the cat gut they used and the other, other things, so there's, we know somewhat. The singing is much harder to know. Though I would tell you, Sue and I spent some time yesterday learning cantillation, 
um, which is the Jewish system of singing the Torah backwards. Well, you read it backwards and you're singing. There's a, if, if you just have time to, for fun, it's called Tricks for Tropes. And it's this young lady teaching 13-year-olds how to sing the, the Torah. And of course, you have to do it all backwards. And she has little hand gestures to help you remember the, the, the tropes. And what they did was um, have a system where you would have a, a, you have a certain sound for certain letters, and then it would combine together. And then you can read anywhere once you learn those sort of basic alphabet. Um, ne neither Sue or I were very good at it. So, but, so the singing we know less about. And we, we followed through the history of it, and we know what the Jewish people think they have done, what they would say was there. The problem with that, from a, a separating yourself from the emotional part of it, is that the Jews were in the diaspora. They were gone for so long, and they were in so many different countries. It's hard to know if the Sephardic Jews and the Ashkenazic Jews had the same experience. Their language is different. You know, the pronunciation is different. There's so many differences that it's hard to get back to what it would have been before the countries went away, right? And, you know, once the Sephardic are the ones that went to Spain, right? So once they were in Spain versus the northern countries, the, 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 we, in America, we know mostly about Ashkenazic Jews because of Fiddler on the Roof, frankly, right? That's our kind of connection to the, but the Sephardic Jews were in, in Spain in the lower countries. They have a whole other system. At, Over, at Interlochen, where I used to teach, we had lots of Jewish students, and any time I would do a Jewish piece, they would say, but my rabbi says, and my rabbi says, and I would have to explain to them Sephardic versus Ashkenazic, because they weren't taught that. Whoever was Sephardic didn't want to know that they were the other, there was another way. You know, their rabbi told them to do it this way. So it, it, that's why we don't know more. Yeah, and we can't really trust that history. Yeah. Incantational. Oh, I remember Incantational. Hand gesture. Yeah, yes. Sorry. Incantational. Yeah, incantation yeah, yeah. It's interesting because then right after that you were explaining what diegetic music is. Yeah. And I was thinking about in technology now on TikTok and all of these reels, which are essentially short clips that play over and over and yeah. over again on your phone. Um, people have been using samples, uh -huh. which of course in modern like really recent music history came from the concept of rappers and people sampling like this yeah, on yeah. tape. But it's interesting because it feels to me as a viewer as though we have reverted back to music prior to narrative music because it is there to create an ambience on the yeah. reel and people, if you're working with a history to create it, yeah. you're sampling that music over and over and over again to capture the ambience of the first people who popularized it. Right. And it has nothing to do with the original intention of the musician. Um, so it's almost like we have taken a very backwards example of what used to be done prior to narrative music and kind of come full circle but flipped it on its head because of course incantational music is extremely musician. Right, right, as a purpose. Yeah, that's really, really struck me. Yeah. I, I think that's right. And those of us that are my age and older, we grew up in a world of narrative music and Broadway shows where the songs were telling a story, right? And, and even the popular music in, from the 40s and 50s had stories. Um, that has gone. You know, there, it, it, country music still has that some narrative. But contemporary popular music doesn't so much, and now it's being sampled and changed. What little story it had has now been broken to pieces. Yeah, so I do think that's interesting. Um, so we watched that in our own lifetime, going backwards in that sense, or going back to that. So, uh, thank you all. Um, good to see you all. Do this again. Yeah.